Prime Minister Honorable Philip J. Pierre, Commissioner of Police Mr. Milton Daisy, staff of the GIS, members of the media, St. Lucians, good morning. I, it is my pleasure to welcome you to a press conference with the Honorable Prime Minister and the Commissioner of Police as we speak about citizen security in St. Lucia. And we are aware of some of the alarming reports of late um, and the Prime Minister and the Commissioner of Police is here to answer questions from the media, um, which we know that the public is interested in hearing. So I will hand over to my colleagues to ask any questions in terms of citizen security um, that they believe is newsworthy and also that um, St. Lucians are interested in knowing answers to. So colleagues, over to you. Oh, no questions. Wow. <laughs> Um, I guess I can start. Um, there's a mic. Good morning, Re Anthony, the voice for Vision newspaper. My question, I guess, to the Commissioner of Police. Um, are, are there any immediate measures government plans to take to all gun violence in the country? Yes, um, there are measures in place to do that. Actually, it's not just now. We have measures in place um, to curb the gun violence in the country, especially down. Um, I know that um, the gun violence is more prevalent, I would say, in the South now, and um, that is what the cry is. Um, what we have done so far is um, to go in there we have um, collaborated with some of the social groups the non-government um, organizations we have met with some of the persons out there we have met with leaders and so on um, with a view of having persons mediate and to quell the situation uh, these are some of the things and also on the other part Police, we have conducted police operations um, in Viewfort. We have frequent patrols. We have increased um, our patrols uh, by means of bicycles. This is something that we never had in Viewfort. Six bicycles were, um, were sent to Viewfort where they go into the immediate um, community uh, to identify issues and so on and to report back to, to, the, um, to the station. Thank you for your question. Sheffield Gillard from Loop News. My question is for you, Mr. PM. What, what, do you, what would you like to say to the families of the island's 35, nearly 35 murdered victims um, right now? 33. Well, well um, first of all, I just want to make it clear that I, like most other citizens of the country, not very happy, very concerned about the crime situation. Um, there seems to be a, a provision of crime throughout the region, which is we, which we feel in St. Lucia. Only this morning in Barbados, there was a double murder. In Jamaica last week, there was a murder of an entire, of an entire family. Trinidad, there seems to be something happening that has caused an escalation of, 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 of murders in the region. That doesn't, make, that doesn't mean that we are good in St. Lucia or we have to sit back and relax and see what's happening in St. Lucia. Is we, we, we will just leave it because it's happening. There seems to be some things happening. There are all these, all these murders in, in, in the US where, where, hundred, where scores of people are killed. So there seems to be something that's happening which is very negative. Having said so, we are very concerned, and we understand that the people of Lucia have to be concerned. We have nothing against people expressing their concern and even their outrage about what's happening in the crime situation. And I too, I, I am outraged. And this is why we are working with the members of the police service to see what we can do to alleviate, alleviate that, that situation. To answer your more direct question, all I can do is wish them um, the families, my sincere condolences, my sympathies. Um, it's not good to lose anybody. Death is nothing nice. And for those who have died, 
and well, it's, I'm, I'm very sorry, but we need to find the, the deeper reason. It's not, it's, not, it's not something that you can just deal with on the surface. You know, um, what's happening in the crime situation is concerning, and the government is concerned, and within the resources that are available to us, we are trying our best. But the situation is not good, and I will be the first person to tell you it needs to change, but we try. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, I'm here. If, if there's no, if anyone, okay. Um, with the current situation, um, crime related facing the island, um, will the RSS be asked to um, intervene, probably come down to St. Lucia to help alleviate that situation? Yes. I've had discussions with the commissioner, he can tell you. He, he also spoke to the, the uh, commandant in the RSS, and we are bringing RSS troops into St. Lucia to assist with, to assist the members of the Royal St. Lucia Police Service. They should be here sometime in July, and it's a fact, yes, after consultation with the high command of the police force, we are. Um, causing some RSS officers to be in some motion. Yes, that's going to happen. Okay, um, Mr. Commissioner, um, that question is for you. $40,000 a month for two canines uh, as part of the canine unit. Um, was that money well spent? Um, I, I could tell you what um, the canine at the time that the canine unit was in existence, what, what are the records? Actually, they attended 47, 47 operations with 63% success. And um, that success included um, firearms and drugs and also cash. We had over $40,000 in just one operation being recovered by the unit. We also had um, nine firearms recovered. By the um, by the unit, and also an amount of drugs being recovered in in that. So at that time, the canine unit putting out putting out the cost of it, a canine unit, and I think it is one of the I would say the tools needed, especially now um, with everything that's going on to to have in the Royal Saint Lucia Police Force. Actually, um, the Canines we had were able to detect large sums of cash, drugs, and firearms. Yeah, yes. What's the status of the unit right now, as we speak? Um, from my understanding, that this unit is um, we are waiting for a renewal of probably its contract, but I don't know um, because it's not within my power to renew. It was not the contract was not. With, between the force and, and the unit. Um, the unit was given to us, also um, customs and um, financial investigations agency. It was open to them to use. But um, in terms of, I believe that we need a unit in the Royal St. Lucia Police Force because it assists. Mr. PM, can you shed some light on, on that? <laughs> on the dogs. Yeah, in terms of the renewal of the, the contract. Okay, um, I mean, I, I know there's a, there, we need some level of excitement in the country. Right? I mean, things after COVID, there's need for, and the press is very happy to, to, to dive in. I, I understand that, you know, I understand. You know, I might tell you something. You know, some time ago, I was also, a, I was a reporter, you know that? And sometime in my life, I worked with yeah, the press. Okay. So I understand the excitement of, of, of the press. You know, um, I, I think that, let, let, let me just think about this. You know, and I hope as this interview continues, I can be able to dispel some of the myths and the lies that are peddling in St. Lucia, real lies. And, I, and I'm, I'm very happy to dispel some of it. I have an agreement in my hand, right? The K-9 unit started in April 2021, okay? It was an agreement for the provision of, of dogs and dog handlers. That was in April 2021. It continued and it, was, it, ought to, it had to be renewed on a yearly basis, right? We continued. The government, the, the, uh, the government of, of, of my, uh, our government continued with the process. But right now, every cent we spend 
we have to send it and look carefully at it. Um, we must not take anything in, in, in silos. This government, right now, we have to subsidize gasoline for the public of St. Lucia by nearly a million dollars. We subsidize flour. We subsidize cooking gas. Never before has any government had to subsidize food stuff as we have to subsidize it. We receive no revenue from fuel, absolutely no revenue. I have a report on my desk right now from the Ministry of Finance to increase the price of fuel, first to make zero cents. To increase it to make zero cents. This is under consideration in my desk now. All the, 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 the profits and the pseudo economists, I need them to tell me, give me a solution to the crisis of revenue, to the crisis in the to crisis of the supply chain, to the crisis of food in the world. If the solutions were available in the world, there would be absolutely no, no discussion. Inflation right now is at its highest for 40 years in the United States. Inflation. Fuel prices are at their highest. There is no one in St. Lucia, regardless of whether they, they, they are geniuses in finance could tell me the solution to the issues that we have now, except the fact that the government must tighten its belts, and the government must be prudent, and the government must look to serve its, the, the greatest priorities. The last government increased the fuel tax by $1.50, ostensibly to pay for the fixing of roads, the roads that they built by direct award. Right now, these roads have to be paid, and we get zero, zero for excise tax. I need the Minister of Finance to tell me how will we pay the debt that he incurred by direct award, with no tendering, for the construction of roads that he said would have been paid from the money from the excise tax. I need to get the answer for that. How will that revenue be raised? So you want to ask me about dogs, but I know what's, what's exciting is dogs now. The, the, the agreement for the, the dogs was, is correct? The Deputy Prime Minister says it's correct. It's $40,000 a month. The agreement was sent to us, but we have to be prudent. We've not signed it. You haven't said we will not sign it. We are is under consideration, and that's a fact. It's, it, it, it's a very simple situation. We had to make the choice. We had to make the choice. I'll tell you something. We've had to have an entire cabinet meeting to discuss the price of bread. This is this is a real this is a real situation. No government has ever had the crisis that we face. Even in COVID times, the government made revenue from fuel. Even during COVID times, at the height of COVID, the government made revenue for fuel. Now, we, we not, we're not making one cent from fuel. So I am I'm very, very concerned about the situation, but I know the government is trying its best. And I defy any talk show host, or any economist, or any so-called so -called competent ex-minister of finance to tell me how. How would it improve that, 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 that situation? So the answer to you on your dog question is that it's under consideration. The agreement is here and it's under consideration. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Um, Mr. Daisy, um, <coughs> is there a need for another operation to fight crime? No, we have, um, continuously we have operations that are intel-driven and so on. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not reinventing the will, we would have new ideas, new um, strategies it's in place, but we continuously have operations to fight crime. Okay, and um, yes, Chef, will cede the mic to someone else with a question. Anyone else? Kareem Nelson from Hot 7. Um, Mr. Daisy, earlier in the week you mentioned that um, Lack of funding challenges the growth of the witness uh, protection program, uh, but feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, won't monies from the Criminal Proceeds Act supposed to, to fund the witness protection program? 
Well, actually, from the um, Proceeds of Crime Act, it's supposed to support law enforcement, and law enforcement is um, actually you have customs contributing to it, you have FIA contributing, you have the police contributing to, to it, and we have resources, other resources are needed. For example, we, we receive some vehicles, we, um, we are constantly receiving re, um, resources, but the, the PM has just explained his constraints with um, finances. So um, when it comes to witness protection, and it is not just simple, it may be one witness, but it spreads to an entire family or friends with that witness. For um, you may have one witness, but he has a wife or she has a, a husband. They have a partner. They have children, and then you cannot um, protect this individual and don't protect the others. So um, it is just a witness protection is a program of activities that you must have sufficient funding for. Okay, um, so on this segment with Commissioner and Prime Minister, we'll take two more questions and then we'll move to our next topic. Right. Um, again, earlier this week you mentioned that um, the police can only work um, within their means. Um, so my question to, be, would be, to you would be, what are some of the major challenges affecting the police force in arresting crime on, on island? Because it, I think it's something the public is putting pressure that the police isn't doing enough, isn't doing enough, but can you at least shed some light on what are some of the challenges? Okay, um, our main challenge is in terms of uh, manpower. We may say that we have 1,300 officers over the island, but um, when you do the maths, it's how many officers are available on a daily basis because you have shifts of um, officers are not machines, they're not robots. You work on an eight-hour shift, so you, you would see that you are dividing your numbers by three. Then you have to cater for um, days off, you have to cater for vacation, and so on, and all other types of leave. So in, in essence, to cover, and day by day we see the activities of the police increasing, what we have to respond to. Um, so you, you would see the need for more officers. If we had more officers, we would be able to flood every community with, an of, with officers so that they are present all the time, but we cannot do that. So we have to prioritize, we have to look at what are the, our urgent needs and then to try to fulfill those needs. So that is um, the first thing that we are looking for. And also there are things in technology, I know um, we are receiving gradually, but technology now to fight crime, that is something that is very important. Thank you, Commissioner. And last question, we'll go to Ms. Talium. Good morning, Kiva Talium, NBC. The question is for Mr. Commissioner. Have any arrests been made with regard to the gun violence which would have been witnessed in broad daylight in V4? Yes, we have had some um, some arrests, and actually, in terms of the homicides that that we've had on um, on island, I think it is 33 recorded homicides on island. We have six of um, them being solved and awaiting, which suspects have been identified and awaiting forensic <coughs> results to charge. We have four in four cases. Persons have been charged and are on remand for those offenses. And we also recorded four police shootings. So in those four police shootings, three of them have been um, recommended for an inquest. And there is one matter, this is the one in Viewfort um, with the young, young um, school, um, young students. This matter is we are waiting advice from the DPP as to the way forward with this particular one. So, um, so we are working on all of them. It takes some t um, sometimes um, the time might be lengthy. Some of them are, um, you could do it right away, and that is with evidence. What evidence you have? Um, did eyewitnesses come forward? Did um, did you get a, a quick match or, or something of forensic evidence? So um, all these things take time. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you to the members of the media. Um, Prime Minister, do you have any closing remarks for this segment on citizen security? Yeah, yeah. just to, to tell, to assure the public of St. the government, like all citizens, we are concerned. We're concerned about the crime situation. Our safety as a people cannot be compromised. 
But with the best will in the world, we have to be able to back it up with resources. Are you trying? I am, I am in the process of signing an, an agreement that will give the, the police service 40 new vehicles. The training vote that was stopped by the last government, the training vote that was stopped by the last government, the training vote that was stopped by the last government has been reinstated this year with $200,000. It, it could be more, but that's what we have now. We, we have started a swift justice program. We are putting $2 million in the budget to, to reduce on the backlog of cases that exist in the system. Right? You heard from you heard from your you heard that there are a number of cases, particularly murder cases, that, that are stuck in the system. We have put in two million dollars in, in what we call a swift justice program. In terms of conditions for the police, we are starting construction on the Grosile police station. In terms of conditions for the police, the Vivot police station. You must understand that the problem at the Viewford police station in its initial stages would have cost the solution taxpayer just over $100,000. Or let's be, let's be fair and see between $120,000. It was left to fester. It was left to fester for years without the government at the time spending $100,000 and that there was no fuel prices, the, no fuel crisis, there was still revenue from, from, from fuel. They allow it to fester, and now it's going to cost us over $2 million to repair the Viewfort Police Headquarters. We are doing that. In the budget this year, there is money to repair police stations. We are looking into the possibility of drones for the police service. We are trying, and, and, and we're starting by, as I said, bringing in the RSS to help, but we're seeing if we can increase the numbers, the numbers in the force. We are trying to boost the morale of the members of the police service. I've met with the welfare, and we've, we are discussing plans to stop some of the problems or to halt or, or to limit some of the problems that exist. So we are trying. I've, I've said to you before that my biggest concern is the security of the country, the economy of the country, and I have a vested interest. And I know some people get annoyed when I say that. They say I say it enough, but I have a vested interest because I went to school on the money of a police officer. So I have a vested interest in the welfare of the policemen and women. So I can assure the public of St. Lucia that the government, within the resources that are available to us, we are leaving no stone unturned to see if we can alleviate the situation of crime in the country. But it is a concern, and I agree that people are concerned about it. Thank you, Prime Minister. And, and just to um, close by saying that crime and citizen security is all of our responsibility. And it is citizens who are committing crime and the public is again encouraged to assist um, the police in their efforts to for information gathering and also um, in the tampering of crime scenes etc so we too as citizens have a responsibility for our welfare and security thank you commissioner daisy and thank you prime minister um, for this session okay commissioner you're free to go <laughs> she's been watching Waiting, wondering when the sands of time will give way to a tide of change and for yesterday and today to become a new tomorrow. For a time when her son can kiss the cheeks of your loved one and her stars can twinkle in her honeymoon skies. When her earthly embrace will reassure and calm your soul. And her unique view can change your whole perspective. She has risen to meet new challenges and to provide safe harbor to all who reach her shores. For her hopes and dreams still stand shoulder to shoulder, 
a precious reminder of experiences yet to come. So wherever your moments and memories take you, let her sense of adventure set you free. Welcome back, everyone. Um, Commissioner, I will let you have some closing um, remarks um, to St. Lucian's and to our media colleagues. Yes. Um, actually, sometime last week, we heard of an anti-gang unit, and persons are asking what is, what really is an anti-gang unit. Mm -hmm. Actually, the aim of an anti-gang unit, and in fact, the one we, we want to introduce to St. Lucia is to dismantle any existing gangs or criminal groups in St. Lucia. And um, by doing this, it is um, getting the, we would need to get the intelligence in terms of their networks. For example, um, I could give you the, for the gun coming into the, in St. Lucia, we do not manufacture guns, so you could safely say that the guns are coming from the outside and coming in. Um, whether it is through the illegal ports or the legal ports. So we have to find the information, especially through the legal ports, where you are trying to dismantle the network, because it has to do with networking, um, with the, firstly, with the supplier, then you have the shipper, then if it is coming through the legal means, at customs, because that is the place where that is the border, we have customs. Um, so we have to get the information as to how those firearms are coming in so that you could break it. Um, it is sometimes most likely that during the process, during that supply chain, whether it is a courier or um, whoever uh, customs uh, broke, the brokers, the, um, the shippers, somebody or more than one of those channels, there are corrupt practices in there. So we need to identify that. And once you could break one of those um, channels, then we believe we can, we can safely dismantle the, um, the gangs. And um, one of the most crucial part of um, the Andy Gang unit is our FIA, the Financial Investigative um, Authority, where they would be going at the assets of those persons who are committing the crime. Because crime persons committing, commit crime for profit. And once you have going after the profit, you have dismantled um, the gang, they would not have the funding required. And also the assistance that they get, whether it be through the um, law enforcement and so on, once you could identify them. And that is one thing that I will not tolerate, in fact, I'm not tolerating in the force, it is um, corruption. And I know commissioners before me, they would tell you the same thing. Um, could give you, just in May, an officer was dismissed for corrupt practice. And this is, um, once we have the evidence, persons, um, we have persons saying police are, are corrupt, this and that, but once we, we must have the information to, to act upon it. And um, once you are going to give information to a criminal, gang, I believe you are a criminal, and then you don't deserve to be in the Royal St. Lucia Police Force. And persons, officers have come crying. I could understand if a mistake is made, but not for assisting criminals, because you are one like them, and then you would be dismissed immediately yeah, for that. At, in the same vein, I want to commend the officers who are out there who are doing their best, especially the SSU who have to respond ever so often when gunshots are fired and so on. You leave your, sometimes I have to take officers who are off, ask them to leave home midnight or whatever time to be in certain locations. So I want to commend these officers. The officers from CRB who are on the ground, especially in view for trying to 
to reach the troubled persons, persons who, um, who we know that sometimes the crime, it does not affect you personally, but persons fear that at what point it would reach my doorstep. So we have guns being fired all over. What time um, a stray bullet would hit an elderly person? You have children who cannot sleep because they are, when they go out, they have nightmares hearing guns. Um, firing at them. So um, these are some of the things, and I applaud the officers who are going into the community to do that. The beaten patrol officers who are always present. So um, just asking the public, I know yeah, everybody, it is we are hearing the cry. It is time now for you to act, but it would not take one day to do it. Um, I'm calling upon the social. Um, services to continue doing what they are doing and more to come in so that they could address the situation in um, in the islands. Um, crime is not just um, what we see. We, we see guns being fired, but there are deeper problems than that. We need to get down into those problems. We have um, upbringing problems. We have, um, we have problems of ill discipline. So uh, we need to correct that so that we could see we could see that that change. Some and um, I may, I may even go further to say that we have a problem with parenting in in Saint Lucia, where parents do not give the proper guidance to persons, or there would be parents who want to give the proper guidance, but these um, these kids would go out there and then get influenced by other persons. Um, we've had instances where school children are being sponsored by these same criminals. So they lure them into doing whatever they are doing. Why go to school and then spend eight hours on a bench when I could get when I could get my sneaker and my 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 whether it's your Nike to go to work. So all these things are issues that we need to to take care of so that we could see a, a change in St. Lucia. However, we, the police, we are committed into doing it. And I know that the government, I, um, the prime minister is consulting with me. I'm consulting with him all the time. And then what are the resources needed? And um, he mentioned the vehicles. I know that is one of the things that would help us a great, a great deal. Yes, thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. And again, thank you everyone for uh, being with us for this segment of our press conference. Um, we'll take a break, and when we come back, we will move on to our economic outlook discussion. Cette lici ka registre vers min corona ek ika fe mouvement ek an chai vitesse tan chak kanef ka kouye pou vilijans public la Fe wolu, pale an plas piblik, kon bol an me, baz, ti boutik, chonje, distan sosyal, sis pie, hod yon alot, ika twa vaitan, si ou santi ko pa kodyal, quarantine ko, patwe a kontak epi lot, an ka ou te twa pe espoze, se an ekwye, Free one one no be ne pot clinic yo pe yo. Le pe ya di mi a kle, sa vle di, le supermarket, pharmacy, e pi ATM, yo accessam avan se tet swe. Pe ya kle an ple, sa vle di tout bagay fe me a 24. Se vi protokol kom soti pa bi wo indikasyon sante. Nou tout ansam, Sa sauve ve min korona. Si nou tout sevi jidla a tout le. What's in the food you're eating? Do you really even know? All the chemicals and hormones used to accelerate their growth. All the artificial flavoring, sweeteners and colors too. We consume and we don't spare a thought for the damage that they'll do. No, think about the children. Think about the children. How will we save them? Chemicals and GMOs are not the solution. 
Excessive agrochemical use, additives, and genetically modified foods are harmful to health and the environment. Join the good food revolution. Grow, buy, and consume organic. A message from Rice St. Lucia and the Ministry of Sustainable Development with funding from the GEF Small Grants Program, UNDP. The good food revolution. And welcome back to our press conference. Um, this time we have Prime Minister Honorable Philip J. Pierre and also Ms. Gemma Lafayette, the Director um, in the Department of Research and Policy. Um, so we will speak about, we will take any questions regarding economic outlook. So that entails inflation, gas prices, supply chain issues. Um, that you can, that the director can speak directly to, and um, also prime minister in terms of how that will, these issues affect the revenue of the country and also our ability to spend on social activities, on health, um, and any other issues of the country. So I would hand over to my media colleagues again. Questions, anyone, or should I start the ball? No? <laughs> if no one has questions, we can go home. <laughs> oh, wow. No questions. Okay, so we'll have a little conversation, Ms. Laffey and Prime Minister. Um, we've seen the increase in um, gas prices probably over the last three, um, well, not three weeks, three terms, because we know we do a, a pass-through mechanism every three weeks. Right. Um, what has caused that because we see government making zero dollars but yet still we're being asked to pay for uh pay more money for gasoline and um, could you just explain to solutions what the process well the process behind that is hi good morning everyone um i would just basically outline quickly to, uh, for benefits of this, this the audience um exactly how the fuel prices are determined in san lucia so there is a price build-up formula that is applied to every shipment of, every, of goods coming into St. Lucia. And we see that that price build-up formula um, determines the retail price. It comprises three main elements, which are essentially the imported price, which is the CIF price of the product, the margins that have been paid to the wholesalers and the retailers, which is the gas stations and Southern Rubies, example, and also the government's taxes. The government collects two taxes, excise tax and customs service charge. So the retail prices are largely, to a very large extent, influenced by the imported price of fuel. And what we've seen over the last few months is that the imported CIF price has increased significantly. Now that, is, that itself has been driven by two separate factors. We observe, for instance, that the crude oil international prices have been increasing by about 60 odd percent um, in 2022 um, compared to 2021 last year. And um, while some may actually regard and basically compare uh, the 2022 crude oil prices with the previous oil price shock in 2008, where the price actually peaked at $140 a barrel, um, there is another factor at play here. So quite apart, from, in addition to the increase in international oil prices, we have a significant and astronomical increase in the refinery cost of the, the crude oil to convert it to gasoline, diesel, and cooking gas. Um, so when we add these two factors together, the crude oil price increase, as well as the added refinery cost, which has escalated during the course of this year, we see that the CIF landed cost in St. Lucia has actually gone up significantly. Um, so that has filtered through to our domestic prices. And of course, just to reiterate here, that the margins that have been paid to Sol and Rubis, which is the wholesaler importer margin, remains fixed since 2005 there about, 2009, sorry, there about. And the retail margin paid to the gas stations is also fixed. So the only variable or the government's policy tool in trying to basically manage and provide relief to the customers um, is really through the excise tax that the government collects on fuel. So while the government collects a small custom service charge as is for every other import, which amounts to about 6% of the CIF value, the government has adjusted its excise tax downward in a very significant way to the extent that it has even gone negative in some periods. So what we see happening is that currently, as of June 13th, 2022, we see that the excise tax on gasoline, which is the main revenue generating item for the government and the main consumption product of the, of the four main products, um, it's really has, it's, has actually negative um, 44 cents. 
Um, but what, what it's not exactly a full subsidy on the gas. Let me just to make that clear, because the government collect, uh, collects about 92 cents on the customs service charge. So overall, the tax take is positive, but it has been significantly reduced compared to previous period. Um, just to basically put the context of the excise, of excise tax, we've seen that for the previous three fiscal years, the excise tax has moved from roughly about $4.50 in the year um, prior to COVID, and it's actually um, gone down a bit the year after that. So what we actually have seen um, in this fiscal year so far is that the excise tax rate on average, while we've had some positives and some negative rates, it has actually averaged about 42 cents a gallon. Um, so the government's tax take in terms of dollar value or revenue that the customs gener um, collects from Sol and Rubis from the gas sales has gone down significantly to the point that um, on excise tax and gasoline. So it has always been, just to basically break it down a bit, uh, to basically give you a full picture of how the entire fuel mechanism works. So I've just spoken about the gasoline and a similar situation happened with diesel. But the biggest... Um, the biggest relief that the government actually has been given is really with the, the LPG cooking gas. So the government has always been subsidizing cooking gas, but the extent of the subsidy has more than doubled or to some extent tripled um, over the last 12 months. Um, so you, as you might be aware, the subsidy on LPG, the 20 pound cylinder, amounts to roughly about $26 um, per, per cylinder and, um, and a similar amount for the 22 pound cylinder. Um, and what we've been seeing in recent weeks is that whatever positive revenue the government collects from gas and diesel, it is not sufficient now to basically pay off or to basically cover the cost of the subsidy on the cooking gas. So the government has found itself in the position where, for the first time um, since the market pasture was introduced in 2009, where the government has to basically now find the cash to refund the importers, Sol and Rubis, to basically actually um, continue to actually sell the product to the consumer. I will stop okay. here for now. It's a bit of a mouthful, but in <laughs> essence, just to wrap it up, to say that um, the, the price that we see at the, at the pump, um, although very, very high by historical levels, um, is significant, is really reflecting the external uh, vagaries in the international market that we have no control over. We're simply price takers in the world market, and um, we're oil, oil consuming public um, uh, country. So um, the government has tried to provide relief for years, for since, from since June 2021, last year, um, till about March of 2021 of this year, the government kept the prices stable to basically um, to shield consumers from the rising price that actually started back then. But when the war broke out in, U in Ukraine, um, the government wasn't able to continue to basically provide to cover um, that sort of shield to that extent, and there were incremental increases. But yet still, despite these increases in the retail prices, the government's ta tax stake has gone down significantly to negligible amounts, and in some cases to negative revenue. Okay, and um, just one question from that I see. We have a question from a reporter. Um, what is the difference? So I know there would have been a projection for, we're in the first quarter, we've just, yeah, second, yeah. we're now in the second quarter. What, is, what was the revenue projection and what did the government actually make? Right. If you could tell um, me. So if I were to take it a bit more on the um, to respond more on the fiscal year basis overall. Okay, fiscal So for yes. instance, um, for this new budget year, um, implicit in the government's approved budget estimates um, was a projection um, for from excise tax revenue on all the fuel mm -hmm. products of about $65, $65 million for the entire year. Um, if we're based on the actual, what has happened so far for the fiscal year and should international oil prices remain at the current levels with no adjustment to the retail prices, we are expecting to actually be in a situation where the government will be having a net negative revenue collection of about $9 million. Um, but to get back to your question, Mondi, um, the government has to, so far for the, from April to, um, to present subsidized um, cooking gas quite significantly to a tune of about close to $5 million. On average, about $1.1 million every three-week period um, for the subsidy. And there's been a very negligible collection on the tax revenue on gas and diesel, which has been close to zero um, for, for the most part for the fiscal year so far. Thank you, Ms. Laffey. Um, Kareem, we'll take your question. Yeah, Kareem Nelson, Odd 7. Um, crude oil products um, are rising. The prices are rising exponentially. Um, just for an example, um, January 17th, just of this year, a 20-pound cylinder was $32.94. Mm -hmm. um, as of the latest update, it's about $43.78. Um, Prime Minister, you have lamented that government makes no revenue on, on fuel. Um, 
how much longer can we continue to subsidize fuel if it continues to rise um, based on the trends that we're seeing? Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure you would have two different responses. <laughs> I mean, the economist would tell me what would tell me what a question that is based in in the science of economics, right? So I won't tell you the answer. <laughs> 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 um, well, really, it, 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 it's a challenge. It's a fiscal challenge, and, and this is why I said previously we have to look at our, our priorities. The government has to look at its priorities. The first, the first answer would be borrowing. Right? We, we also have issues as far as borrowing is concerned. Our debt to GDP ratio is bordering in the 90s. I mean, it's not at a situation of, of, of chaos yet, because some of our neighbors are like a But on this current trajectory, it's, it, it's not looking good. Our other. In our other concern would be revenue from tourism. Up to this day, we have not reached the 2019 tourism figures as yet. Our revenue from tourism has not reached the 2019 in 2022. The third source would be from the Citizens by Investment Program, the CIP. And as you know, that program is under tremendous stress from Europeans under tremendous stress. So we cannot project too deeply into the future as far as the CIP is controlled. But, but the important factor is we do not know how long the war in Ukraine will continue. We have no idea. We do not know how long this will continue. So we cannot, so we have to measure our uh, responses. Right now we have an issue with, with, with flour. Last month we subsidized flour. We sold flour to the, the bakers at a cost of, I think, $35 per bag. And the landed cost for flour was over $100. But the government had to actually subsidize in terms of cash into the system so that we could keep bread at its present price. What will happen moving forward is something we are in negotiations with the bakers for. So, your, so the answer to your question is we really cannot predict the future because it's so volatile. We do not know what, what will happen, how it will happen. Yeah. So, but That's we are measuring and then we are keeping our priorities. We are ensuring that our priorities are kept to a level where the people will, will benefit. Not to sign the fact that we have to continue to pay our debt because if we default on our debt payments, that's bad for the, for the economy generally. Any other questions, or should I continue? <laughs> continue? Okay. Wow. Um, I have a question on terms of um, the economic outlook for signature. Um, Prime Minister, given um, the issues at hand, and we know, again, we see in the UK, we have reports of consumers adjusting their purchasing habits. We see in the, um, the United States a similar um, issue arising because of the inflation. Um, and we know St. Lucia has a lot of imported inflation. So what is that? What are some of the policies of the government? And also what is your message to the citizenry in terms of the escalating food prices um, going on globally? First of all, I'd like to address Lafay to speak about inflation <laughs> as an economist. Um, explain inflation. Prime Minister, you're an economist. No. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, can you just explain, Ms. Lafay, inflation, the, 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 what is inflation, important inflation, and stagflation? If you do that, then I can come after you. Okay. So you will, you will be explaining okay. it from a strictly scientific point of view as an economist. Right, so inflation really is um, the increase, that what, we, what we call inflation is really what we term um, consumer price inflation. And what we observe is what you call headline inflation. I'm not sure if you're aware of those terms. Uh, but it really is just a measurement of um, the change in the price level on average um, that has been measured by the consumer price index from period to period. And so basically, you, and if, so the inflation rate really is the, the change, the percentage change in that, that CPI, the consumer price index, from one period to the next. 
Now, the consumer price index is measured um, as is any other economic statistics. And of course, there are some er um, er issues with all measurements. Um, but it really is based on a, a household budget survey that was, that's been done by the, the Central Statistics Office, where um, the, there's a basket of goods that are actually been um, deemed to be what is an average use for consumers in St. Lucia. And then that the pricing of those items in that basket have been monitored through every month and then um, that basically generates the data for um, exactly that tells you or give you a measurement or a sense as to exactly how um, consumer prices are actually moving. Of course, in that same basket, you have some things that are more heavily weighted based on people's um, spending as a ratio of their total income on those. So for instance, in our consumer price index, um, we have food being the most heavily weighted index. It means that the average person in St. Lucia actually spends a lot more on food than any other products. Also, we would have other key items like, for instance, um, energy products like um, electricity, housing, um, uh, fuel products that, we, that have been purchased, as well as transport. So these are some of the more heavily weighted indices that actually tend to move a lot more with the um, imported inflation. So being a, a a c country that's not, that just relies heavily on imports. Um, we're quite an open, small economy. Um, a lot of what the purchases of imports from outside of St. Lucia um, come with um, prices which move in line with what happens outside of St. Lucia. So that's what we basically would term um, imported inflation. So an imported this goods to St. Lucia, um, the consumers here are basically faced with um, the factors that actually influence those, um, those prices um, in, in the current environment in a negative manner. Um, so that's pretty much exactly what, is hap what inflation really is. It's just basically saying that on average that the consumer price level or the person's ability to basically buy the same basket of goods um, for, for some years ago to today has actually moved um, and has increased. Um, regarding stagflation, so typically when you have a mix of high inflation as we have now and it has a dampening effect on global, uh, well, global growth or growth in any economy, we say um, in economic terms that that is a situation of stagflation. Um, so currently, I think someone raised the issue before about the looming recession um, in the world. Um, so we see now there's been a lot of debate, a lot of talk or expectations that perhaps the advanced economies like the US, which is our major trading partner, um, is heading towards a recession. Um, some think that it's, it's, it's not likely. It's likely over the next 12 months. Um, but others think that um, if the, there's um, timely interventions by those countries, that, that could, they, we could avoid a situation where we have stagflation. But nonetheless, having said that, um, we are in an environment where having suffered the effects of COVID um, in 2020-21 and being faced again with this other shock, which is a price shock, which has been triggered, exacerbated by the um, Russian invasion of, uh, well, the, the war in Ukraine, um, we, that has had untold damage um, to prices. So we've seen that um, producers of a lot of, well, Ukraine being a heavy producer of wheat and some of the critical products that are used by the world, and also Russia being a, heavy, a, a very major producer of oil, that c these two factors combined have generated an, uh, an un somewhat, not unprecedented, but a very un unusual situation, which we have not seen in the last four decades. Um, so prices globally has just risen astronomically, and consumers are pretty much trying to get, grapple with um, facing those prices. Um, so we, as a small open economy, and um, uh, we're faced with very, very high inflation. In St. Lucia, we are looking at um, an inflation rate just about 5 to 6% for this year. And that, just to put it in the historical context, we had periods where we had deflation, which is a negative change um, in the price level a few years ago. And um, we've seen that with the, um, with the war, that this has plunged us, along with all other countries in the region, and by extension, the world, um, into a very high inflation environment. Uh, yeah. Prime Minister? Yeah. yeah. And if I can just add, what's, so my, my, what I want to say is, is what the government is doing. You heard Ms. Laffey speak about the CPI and the, and the basket of goods. Government has these goods, most of them are under price control, in that the, the, the price, the wholesale and retail price, is monitored by the government. Included in, in that price was a 6% service charge on these goods. What the government has done is the government is losing further revenue by removing that 6% on these goods. So what that would mean is that the new imports would be 6% more if the government had not removed this service charge. So even if the price goes up, 
because as Ms. Laffey spoke about, spoke because the price of the import went up, because the government has removed the 6%, anything you pay for it, it would have been 6% more if the government had not in intervened. That is as far as these basic control goods are concerned. So any anything you buy now, in terms of not everything, but in terms of the goods that are under price control, you would have been paying 6% more if the government had not in intervened. That's Prime Minister, I also want to say what because of inflation and the varying in prices so rapidly um, outside of St. Lucia, it doesn't necessarily mean that the good might be cheaper. No, but you would have been paying 6% more. Yes. Right. Okay. So the consumer That's would, important. Yeah. So the yes. consumer would have been shielded to some extent. By 6%. Mm -hmm. Of course, the government doesn't control much of the, the price that consumers face, but the, within its, um, its ability to actually do that, the government basically pretty much uses its tax its tax policy to basically adjust it um, and basically suffer the revenue loss, which would mean it's in, um, higher deficits for the government and higher debt. But at the same time, it's trying to basically counterbalance those conflicting objectives of generating sufficient revenue to basically bring down our deficits and our debt levels, and at the same time, basically providing consumers with as affordable as possible prices to basically minimize the adverse effects of these shocks um, on them. Um, just as an example, for instance, um, if the government had not intervened in the in the in the um, in the fuel prices, um, Saint Lucia, as of now, would have been facing much higher prices, as we see in Saint Kitts, in Barbados, and even in Anguilla, um, which the retail price of gasoline, for instance, hovers around eight, between eighteen to twenty dollars a, a, a gallon, and yet, uh, but we're still at seventy ninety five. Um, so. Again, the consumer would have faced a lot higher prices had the government not decided to basically reduce the excise tax take and basically go into negative territory to subsidize, um, to some extent, some of the products. Okay. And then also, our VAT rates, mm -hmm. something, something that we have we, we seem to have forgotten. Our VAT rate is the lowest in the entire region, right? Yes. It's the lowest. Some countries pay 17.5% VAT. Some, I think some Canadians pay 21% VAT. I'm not sure about that. But we pay 12.5%. So it's a double whammy. So we're losing revenue on, from, from, it, from, from our excise tax, and our VAT rate is lower than anywhere else in, in, in the region. And further, we have the most exempt, exempt goods, again, as far as VAT is concerned. So whereas there are many exempt and zero-rated goods, such as VAT, in most of, uh, of our, our, our countries, our neighboring countries, there are very few exempt. In some countries, there are zero exempt goods from that. So it just shows the, 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 the peril we face as far as revenue is concerned. Plus, our high debt and our short-term debt. Um, the, the debt we have for, for the roads, over $200 million worth of road debt is short-term debt, high-interest short-term debt. We, we, that debt is, has to be repaid in five years. Normally, debt of that nature is repaid in 20, 20 years. years. Mm -hmm. Now, but we have to pay these debts in five years. Plus the fact we have payables that stand now at about $100 million. At some point, it was about $150 million. And these payables are due to local suppliers. We have to pay the locals. We have to pay them so that we can we can we can generate economic activity in the country. So we we are caught with that, and these and these are not these are not our making. We were not the ones who incurred that short-term debt at five and a half percent over five years. We were not the ones who, who incurred it, but we have to pay it, and the revenue to pay it should have come from the $1.50 increase in excise tax. That's where the large revenue should have come to pay these debts. We have not got that, that revenue, but we have to find the money to pay these short-term election rules. Okay. Um, Prime Minister, my last question to you, and then I guess Ms. Laffey could have some closing words, and so will you. Um, there must be some good news, some good things happening in St. Lucia. I know the economic outlook um, seems a little dreary. Um, and again, as you have stressed, not to any 
not by any of our making, um, but anything that St. Lucians can look forward to in terms of investment opportunities. Um, we know you've been on some recent trips. Um, there's been a heavy focus on green financing and climate change resilience and adaptation. Um, can you speak to any of um, projects in the pipeline for St. Lucia? Yeah, but first of all, let me speak about, let me tell you something about what is of great concern. What's of great concern is, is climate change. It's a, it, it's a phenomenon that is hitting the world because of the carbon emissions, because of what's happening. And the sad thing is that the countries that are most heavily affected are not the greatest carbon emitters. Um, but we, we, we are paying for it. And, it. and every time I spoke, whether it was at the Summit of the Americas or at the Core of Heads of Government Conference, I spoke about the effect of climate change on St. Lucia and the effect of climate change on, on the region. And I made the point that all over the world hears about is when there are, there are big hurricanes, and hurricanes, etc. But every day, and, 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 and it was significant, why is I was saying that we, we are having floods in Castries? When rain falls, we have landslides, we have floods. And then we have to repair, we have to adapt, we have to mitigate, causing further strain on our fiscal budget. The rains that, that, that fell yesterday, I'm sure there are parts in the country where we have to do some, some mitigation. Because if so, climate change is a serious issue, and I really hope that the press and the people of St. Lucia can, can inform people as to the reality of climate change. In the negotiations for our loans now, we have to put in a climate, a, a, a climate clause to mitigate against what's happening. There's, there's talk about the vulnerability index, where because of our national income, we are graded as a middle-income country. And the reality is we are not, <clears throat> because we are highly indebted. The <clears throat> there, is work, there is work happening now to see whether we can convince the IMF and the World Bank and the international financial institutions to, to treat us, give us special and differential treatment as far as our loans are concerned. These are the negotiations that, that are happening. These are the discussions we had, we had in the U.S., discussions we had with President Biden, discussions we had at, at, the, at the Heads of Government Conference. And this week, I, I go to Suriname, where these discussions will continue. So these are the realities that, that we face. The realities of climate change, the realities of high debt, and the realities of crime that is spoke to a while ago. But there is some good news. <clears throat> for the first time in Lucia for a long while, we've started, we've seen the start of hotel projects. And I'm very pleased to tell you that that is just the beginning. You, you, you would know that for the last five years, we've, we've not had one new hotel project in Lucia, not one. Neither before COVID or after COVID. Right now, We've started, there are at least two hotels that have already started, Kazaba Beach and the extension to Sanders Halcyon. The outlook for the tourism industry is very positive, but again, there are downsides because of the high price of fuel, the cost of travel is expensive, and St. Lucia, as you know, is a high-priced destination. So we have to deal with that, but they are very, positive signs as far as our tourism is concerned. In terms of agriculture, we've sent to ship bananas to England, and I've, I got a report from the Ministry of Agriculture that the quality was good, so we hope to continue shipping bananas to the UK. But for the first time in many years that we're actually shipping bananas to the UK, and I know I was the I was the the butt of humor when I spoke about bananas. But you see, what has really happened is that because of my my pronouncements on bananas, farmers have got inspired, and people and they are planting they, they are planting bananas, and the local people are doing many things with bananas. We are adding value, and this was what was important. We have to add value on our banana product, and we we are doing that. So that is good. Secondly, in terms of agriculture, we're doing very well as far as our, our, our CMOS is concerned. Our CMOS production is increasing. Again, we're trying to, to, to add value to, to it. So th there's great demand for St. Lucian CMOS. In fact, there's so much demand for St. Lucian CMOS 
that a country has created a product that, that they call Lucian Simos. So we have to put, we have to get now to put what is called an identity marker on our products to ensure that when, when they call it CMOS, it's really authentic, St. Lucian CMOS. In terms of our, our cultivation of bees, of, of honey, that is increasing. So then there are some good signs. But we need to incentivize agriculture. We need, because of the issues as it relate to food in importation, and the issue of food shortages is a very serious issue. This is why in Suriname this week, we, we are going to discuss how can Guyana help in our food security issues. There was a food investment seminar a, a, a few weeks ago. What we want to do, Guyana has said that because of the, the, the land space that they have available, that they can make, they can become basically the food basket for the region. So we are having these discussions to improve our food security. But we also have to see about, about transportation, because you have to move these goods and services between these islands. So it's, it's, it's exciting times, but it's difficult, it's trying. We have to get our, our priorities right, and then we need to find the, the, the mix between social investment, social infrastructure, and being able to meet our commitments as far as our debt is concerned. The, that is the balance we have to, 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 to strike. But in terms of the future, it's challenging, but I'm very optimistic about the future. Thank you, Prime Minister. And Ms. Lafay, just to wrap up, um, you have some closing time. Um, based on the economic outlook, um, St. Lucia and the world, what would be your recommendations to citizens in terms of how they live? Um, just to reiterate what the Prime Minister said um, regarding the global the outlook. Um, of course, it's um, challenging times ahead, um, but there is, well, we would have, re just to go back a bit um, to indicate that coming from the downturn, the very, very sharp contraction that we had in activity um, uh, in 2020, um, our GDP fell by about 25% in that year. And the recovery has start, started. So last year in 2021, we would have actually rebounded partially to just about 12%. Um, from that, but we're still below the pre-COVID levels. We are expecting that um, despite the headwinds and the very trying circumstances that, that the world finds itself in at this point in time economically, um, that we expect our tourism product to hold, hold its own. Um, of course, um, subject to the different um, um, eventualities that affect um, travel, like for instance, the, the pandemic and how that evolves, and then the, the threat looming threat, not necessarily that the extent to which monkeypox, if at all, would have any meaningful impact um, on our tourism output um, going forward. Um, but again, back to the inflation, on, which is the, the, the area of concern um, for most um, countries around the world economies. Um, while now the inflation prices, the prices are actually quite high at a very, very 40-year um, um, peak, we are expecting, and I think there are some early signs um, in the advanced countries, that the prices are beginning to ease a bit and they seem to be coming on a downward. It's still too early to say, of course, it's unpredictable what the situation, how it actually unfolds, but we are, it, there, there is the expectation generally that moving out of 2022 into 2023, that um, the price levels and inflation will basically subside to some extent over the medium term, um, over the next two to three years. Um, and the same applies for St. Lucia. Of course, we're a reflection of exactly what happens on the outside, on the inflation side. Um, but again, of course, with oil prices being very unpredictable, no one knows what's going to happen with the, about how long the war will continue or will be sustained, and to what extent the counterbalancing fact factors of supply and demand actually weigh in favor of the oil producing countries. Um, so for instance, the extent to which um, the OPEC countries might decide to increase their supply, um, we, um, we're not sure exactly what will happen with that. But we generally expect, and I think the general uh, consensus among industry experts is that those prices actually will be coming down somewhat in 2023. On the uh, real sector side, as the PM would have indicated and I said earlier, um, we are expecting that our, despite these challenges and the, the, the very unfavorable economic environment, external environment, the government expects that the tourism um, sector will continue to rebound towards pre-COVID levels by about the year 24, 2024, to basically get back to 2019 levels by then. Um, so the outlook for St. Lucia is still somewhat um, promising amidst the, the challenges that there are. But of course, we have to basically urge persons um, 
in terms of the expectations, to temper the expectations a bit, and to basically um, do whatever is within their powers, uh, the control, to basically adjust the, the spending um, accordingly to minimize the effect of the high escalating prices um, on, on their budgets. Um, of course, again, um, to whatever extent um, persons can, and even businesses, can basically conserve energy and also begin to actually um, promote and basically increase our food security to help us actually um, grow more of what we eat and to basically reduce our input bill and therefore to basically reduce our reliance on, on, on imports. So um, it's a challenging time and um, it might not be, it's, it, I think we need to basically ride this wave um, with um, some level of confidence and hope that the coming years uh, would be would still remain promising and there will be relief along the way sometime in the medium term. Uh, I think I would stop now at this point. Thank you, Ms. Laffey. And Prime Minister, two um, questions before you give your um, wrap-up that I had in my notes. Um, I s we've noticed some, um, I'd like to call it propaganda, um, in re the DFCs. So we understand you spoke about it briefly in terms of what is owed in terms of road roadworks. Um, there was something circulating on social media about the government being asked to pay, I'm not sure asked by whom, to pay for $34 million to um, fresh start re-road construction. Um, can you provide any clarification on that matter for us? Yeah, um, yes, Moni. First of all, I just want to make it clear that the government has met or is meeting all its obligations. Um, it's difficult, but in terms of obligations towards all these DFCs, the government is meeting them. Um, it's meeting them. Sometimes we're late, but we're meeting them. The, the, and not, you call it propaganda, but it's more than propaganda, it's dangerous. There's been absolutely no agreement to pay Fresh Start any money, not one cent. There's no agreement, there's no court order, there's no arbitration order, there's nothing. There's nothing that exists to pay Fresh Start one cent as far as the Talvan and Shock Roads are concerned. And coincidentally, I have a letter from Fresh Start. You see, pushers of propaganda and people who do not speak the truth must always try to cover their bases before they speak of these things. There's a letter dated June 29th, 2022, from Fresh Start, and here is what the letter, the letter says. It says, we would like to kindly request an update on the status of the above stated claims presented to your organization on December 22nd, 2021. That's the letter. They are requesting an update. So if we paid them $47 million, they would not, rec they would not request an update. I want to tell the public that is completely false, completely untrue, and the government, what the government has done is the government has terminated the contract and then negotiations are happening. But there's been no agreement to pay first that, not one cent. No agreement, not one cent as far as the Talvan and Shock Roads are concerned. And I can prove, and I have evidence to, to prove it. And um, finally, my last question before Prime Minister gives his closing remarks. Um, any update on uh, the vaccines as purchased from Radical Investments? Um, I know I'm on behalf of the public of St. Lucia today, guys. <laughs> um, I've seen this question a number of times on social media. People wanted to know what the status was on to, in terms of the payment, the refund for the vaccines yeah. that we did not receive. Um, the vaccines that we... In fact, um, there are certain, you know, there are many things that that we are going to put in the public domain very, very shortly, very, very, very soon. You know, you know we've we've sat for a year. We've tried to settle the government. We've worked with the technocrats. We've tried to settle the government. We've tried to settle the country after the the, the pandemic. We tried to settle it now because of the Ukraine war. But in the coming year, I can assure the press that many of the unfounded things and many of the threats and many of the things that you will hear are going to be cleared. I can assure you. You're going to be, you're going to be hearing a lot more about St. Jude. 
You're going to be a lot more about the, the, the John Compton Dam project. You're going to be going to be hearing a lot more about the extension, the road, the highway. You're going to get a lot more about the vaccines. You're going to be going to be, you're going to be hearing a lot more. I can tell you to tighten your seatbelts. There's going to be a lot that's going to be said about these things. The, the, the year was a year of consolidation, a year of settling the government, a year of dealing with the, with, with the issues. As far as the vaccines are concerned, there has been an, an inquiry into the vaccines. Fact is, we've not collected this, the, the $7 million that was paid. There, have been, there, there has been an inquiry. The owner of the company, Radical Investments, he's paid a million dollars, and he's paid a one point one point five million dollars on the the three million dollars I think he had to pay. He's paid one point five million dollars, and he's promised to pay the rest, which is evidenced by a letter. But as I've said before, you cannot blame. So the, the person who provided the vaccines, you can't blame them. If somebody offers you $7 million in advance as a businessman, you, you, you will take it. That is just common sense. But I want to just give you a, 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 a little tidbit of a report that we are um, into the vaccine scenario. Just a little, a little tidbit, and I want to read for you. <clears throat> In a press release from the Prime Minister's office, dated July 1st, 2021, note the date, July 1st, 2021, he stated that the procurement was done in accordance with procurement and stores regulations and that due diligence was done by the Ministry of Finance. However, we noted from the dates of the documents presented, as well as our review of the direct award procedure being used at the time, we saw no documentary evidence to substantiate that due diligence was done by the Ministry of Finance prior to the signing, signing the agreement and facilitating payment. In other words, the Prime Minister at the time lied. So that is that is as far as that that is part of, of the of the, the the vaccine story. And these are not my words. These are words of an of an independent inquiry that was performed looking into the vaccine issue. So there's a lot more to 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 there's a lot more to talk about about that that issue. But fact is, we've collected 1.5 million dollars, and we are hoping to collect the rest, but it was a bad deal, and the blame must fall squarely on the shoulders of the former Minister of Finance. He was irresponsible, he was hasty, he was reckless, and he paid no attention to the welfare of the taxpayers of this country. Okay, thank you, Prime Minister. And any closing remarks um, for the citizens? Um, well, as I said, as I said before, I want to, first of all I want to thank the the staff of the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Commerce. The finance it, it, it has been trying times. We just came through a budget process. Uh, resources are limited, and then the the the, the demands are great. Um, but there, there are a few things we can report about. We've started the one laptop program. We've paid facilities fees for students, we are paying CXC fees for English and maths, we, we have increased our social, our social spending, we've started a housing program, there are some investments that, that, that are on stream, there are certain things we can be proud about, certain things we can be proud about. But there's, always, there's always room for improvement and the government is completely looking at ways and means of improving, of making processes better, of improving the, the situation for the people of St. Lucia. The, we've got, we have some serious headwinds, we have some serious challenges, but like I said before, I am optimistic. We're working together with the technocrats in the Ministry of Finance, the technocrats in the, in the Ministry of Commerce, 
We are seeking the best advice. We're working with our international financial partners. We're speaking to the World Bank. We're speaking to the IMF to see how we can come to a solution that will improve the lives of the people of St. Lucia. Our purpose in politics is to improve the lives of the people of St. Lucia. We are going to be launching our youth economy in, at the budget, at the meeting of parliament on Tuesday, the 12th of July. We're going to be launching our youth economy, which is an exciting prospect for the, 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 the young people of St. Lucia. We are also going to be passing our special prosecutor bill, which is going to be able to bring correctness if there's any, if there is any need for it. I know you've been asking me all the time, what are you going, what are you going to do? But as I said before, we are a government of principle, we are a government of due process, and I was not about making any accusation without due process or without proof. So I could make the accusation on the vaccines and make the point that the Minister of Finance was reckless and irresponsible because I have the documentary evidence to back it up. I want to tell the public of St. of St. Russia that I want to thank them. It's, it's going to be one year since we're in, we're, we're in government. I want to thank them for their support. I want to thank the civil service, the police, the other public officers for, for their cooperation and the hard work that most of them have, have put into the system. It's challenging, but it's exciting. We look forward to next year of, of great promise, but there are many circumstances that are beyond, beyond our control that we have little control of. I thank you very much. Thank you, Prime Minister, and thank you, Ms. Laffey, for, for joining us. And thank you to the members of the media for being present and to the staff of the GIS for accommodating us. Thank you, St. Lucia. Until next time. Thank you. All right, guys.